Good evening. It's five o'clock. So I'll call the February 3rd select board meeting to order. We are using Zoom webinar for meetings, which allows for the public to participate in the meeting as an attendee. Attendees must register to participate. The registration link is unique to the meeting. The registration link can be found in the description of the Nantucket Government TV YouTube live feed for the meeting. People registering to be an attendee must use their names, otherwise they will not be allowed to participate. Attendees will join in listening mode. They can click raise their hand button if they wish to speak. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order in which they were raised at the appropriate time. As a preliminary matter, I'm Don Holgate, chair of the Nantucket Select Board. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Um, board members first in the order in which I see you, Melissa Murphy. Here. Christy Parentella. Here. Jason Bridges. Here. Matt Fee. Here. Thank you. Um, I will go through town staff members that are present this evening. Erica Mooney. Here. Florencia Rulo. Here. Jericho Miele. Rachel Day. Present. Amy Baxter. Here. And Amy, you're not muted. Um, Tucker Holland. Here. Roberto Santa Maria. Here. Brian Turbot. Present. Tom Rafter. Here. Andrew Vors. Here. And then I'll, um, we have a new employee with us this evening, Kamal McCarthy. We'll be introducing him shortly. Here. Um, and then other guests on the agenda, John Giorgio from Town Council. Here. Walter Hang to discuss PFAS. And Hank Naughton. Here. Um, then we also have Brian Swain present. Here. Okay, I think I've got everyone for now. This open meeting of the select board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment as previously noted. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to share the screen of your computer. Um, anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials for this meeting are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along. Um, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. People can raise their hands for questions or comments. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. And finally, each vote will be taken via roll call. Um, I think we do have one extra announcement tonight that I'll go to Tucker for. And um, under pending contracts, the Arcadis contract uh, has been put over to next week. And I don't think that there are any other changes. Uh, the meeting's being video and audio recorded and I will turn it over to Rachel to introduce Kamal. Uh, good evening. So as many of you recall, we had a three-phased hiring approach to the diversity, equity, and inclusion director. And we had an individual um, selected for a recommendation through a, um, we were calling it a screening work group. 
and in the end it consisted of six total members. And we had a potential candidate in November and that unfortunately did not come to fruition. So the work group reconvened and we looked at the other top final candidates, candidates and we re-interviewed a few of them. And one of them, um, we was recommended for hire earlier in January. And now he is here tonight to give us a little background information about himself. Um, so I will introduce and turn it over to Kamal McCarthy. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, Select Board and Nantucket community at large. I'm Kamal. And it is my honor to serve as the new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director for the Sign of Nantucket. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to some individuals on island that have supported me over the years to now take on the challenges and responsibilities of this position. Thank you to Barbara Ann White, Barbara Elder, and Peter Panji. These former educators and other teachers have positively impacted me to trust in my abilities to accomplish whatever is set before me. Thanks to local mentors like Dr. Francis Cartoonan, Joan Wilson Godot, and Molly Anderson for guiding my interest in Nantucket history. Also, I am beyond proud to call Mr. and Mrs. Richin, Uncle Neville, and Aunt Kathy. They have supported me in my endeavors. These individuals and many other locals have influenced my willingness to undertake this opportunity. I must also give a shout out to those that are no longer with us, who have also directly impacted me sitting before you today. Thanks to Bill Oliver, Mr. and Mrs. Spriggs, and the members of the Friends of the African Meeting House that continuously showed up to events at the Meeting House. Hopefully, the impacts of all individuals mentioned and others will be reflected in my performance as the first DEI director. Now, I don't like talking about myself, but I will briefly take this opportunity to share my academic journey and experiences that qualified me for this position. As reported, I have a bachelor's degree in political science and minored in both anthropology and African-American studies. I also have a master's degree in labor studies and I am completed my doctorate degree in organizational leadership at Northeastern University. My time in school alongside working at the Nantucket Athenaeum, the Community Preservation Committee, the Museum of African-American History and volunteering on nonprofit boards on island have contributed to my confidence to accept and look forward to this new opportunity. Before ending, I would like to say thank you to Town Manager Libby Gibson, Human Resources Director Amanda Perry, and thank you to the members of the search committee for offering me this chance. I truly appreciate your trust in me to get the job done or at least started. I look forward to working with every town department supervisor, the rank and file, and to work with the community at large to demonstrate the significance and benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. We're really glad to have you on board. Welcome. Welcome, Kamal. Um, so um, Tucker has one other announcement that wasn't on the agenda. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. And let me also say welcome to Kamal. Um, the housing the Affordable Housing Trust would like to hear from you. In conjunction with the update of our housing production plan, we are most interested in hearing your thoughts about housing on the island. Please let us know by completing the survey prepared by J.M. Goldson and Barrett Planning Group. Links to the survey can be found on the Affordable Housing Trust page of the town website. There, you can click on the link for the survey in the language of your choice. English, Portuguese, or Spanish. The survey only takes a few minutes to complete and it will be open until February 12th. I wanna thank you in, in advance for your participation. Please spread the word. And I would now turn it over to Vanessa and then Florencia. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, o Affordable Housing Trust significa fundo de habitação a preços acessíveis. Este conselho gostaria de ouvir você. Os membros desse conselho estão muito interessados em ouvir sua opinião sobre a habitação na ilha para a atualização do plano de produção habitacional deles. Informe-os preenchendo a pesquisa preparada por GM Godson and Barrett Planning Group. 
Os links para a pesquisa podem ser encontrados na página do Affordable Housing Trust, no website da Câmara Municipal de Nantucket. Lá você pode clicar no link da pesquisa no idioma de sua preferência, inglês, português ou espanhol. A pesquisa leva apenas alguns minutos para ser concluída. A pesquisa ficará aberta até 12 de fevereiro de 2021. Agradecemos antecipadamente a sua participação e, por favor, divulgue esta pesquisa. Thank you. Um, el Fondo de Vivienda Asequible quiere conocer la opinión de los residentes de Nantucket. Junto con la actualización del Plan de Producción de Vivienda, HPP, nos interesa conocer lo que usted piensa sobre las necesidades de vivienda en la isla. Cuéntenos su opinión al completar la encuesta que ha preparado el grupo de planeamiento J.M. Colson y Barrett. Puede acceder a la encuesta visitando la página web de Affordable Housing Trust o el Fondo de Vivienda Asequible, eh, yendo a www.nantucket.ma.gov-nahht donde encontrará el enlace de la encuesta en español, inglés o portugués. Completar la encuesta solo lleva unos minutos y tiene tiempo hasta el 12 de febrero. Gracias por participar. Comparta la encuesta con sus familiares y amigos. Thank you so much. Thank you for having that in three languages. It's fantastic. Um, next, we are moving on to our COVID-19 weekly update. Are there any opening public comments or comments from the board? Not seeing any hands, I will turn it over to Roberto Santamaria, our public health director. Good evening, how's everyone today? Uh, so we're looking into the, uh, let me try to share my screen. Okay, so I will turn, ooh, there we go there. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, um, so we'll go by today's report, which is actually really good news today. So at a, we've had 23,821 tests, a uh, total positive of 1,130. Um, the stop the spread numbers I will be able to report next week. I've already put in a request for it. But oh, what's going on? Sorry about that. And then what we saw a few uh, last month and then going into this month, I um, mean, going into January was a significant spread. But over the last seven days, we've more than had that number again. So I put some of the retrospective numbers in there so that we can see how quickly we've actually been able to slow down that spread, which is great news for the island. And then uh, as we go along, we'll be able to get more information. Our 3% daily average, our seven day average is down to 3% uh, for positivity rate. We're still in really good testing capacity. Stop the spread is still in. Um, I, we have, I have not received word as to whether or not it will be extended past its last deadline, um, but we are working on that, getting that information. So as far as the metrics go, this is exactly the, sim the, the type of curve that you want to see. This last part where you're seeing it starting to level out up here on the top right. Um, that's, that's the term of flattening the curve. So let's, let's keep it going, Nantucket. We're doing very well. Um, where, where the end is in sight. So it's exactly what we're saying here, where this section here is starting to flatten out. And this is probably the best graph on this entire slide. Uh, you will see that we have our case index from the sewer plummeted. Um, you'll see that the flow rate did drop. It was at 1.2 uh, la last week. But this week we're at uh, 0.92. But what you will see is that we've dropped. We've brought it down to less than one case per day on average incidents. And that's exactly what we've been seeing this week. Um, we're, once we get the new sewer report, we're hoping that it will stay along the same lines. The sewer report, we did put in a request to BioBot to start looking for the new variants. Uh, they are in the process of standardizing that test. And once they get approval to continue to do so, they'll be able to start 
giving us information as to whether or not uh, variants are here. But uh, we're 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 moving forward. As far as the daily incidence goes, we've seen this really go down through our seven day average. Um, as far as the R number goes, we've been able to bring it down to approximately 0.5, uh, 0.4 really, if you round down. Um, I was going to say, as comparison to the rest of the state, where we are, the rest of the state has an R number of approximately 0.85. So we've we've been able to slow down the spread much quicker than the state did. So that's why you saw such a drastic reduction in numbers over the last two weeks. So we're, we're doing something right here. As far as the vaccine plan goes, we are now in phase two. Uh, you may have seen on the news and all the postings now that we opened up the clinics this morning at 11 o'clock this morning with our very first uh, patients or members of our community who have 75 plus. Uh, step one of phase two, um, we were able to start that clinic today and things are going smoothly. Um, that was a lot of hard work, uh, months of work um, from our staff, from my staff. I'm really proud of them. And then um, the hospital was able to uh, step in and also bring that home. Um, uh, when, the, when we realized some of the logistics issues of being able to receive the vaccine and keep going, we were able to bring the, the hospital in and they they really brought that home for us at the end. But a lot of, we've had almost six months of prep, maybe more uh, coming into this. Once we found out that the vaccines were coming uh, in around November, we've been working on that since November. So um, Jericho, Steve Murphy, Libby, Greg, Rachel, all of us, thank you uh, for the work that you've done in getting this. It was Herculean effort in Atlantean really. And then now we've been working with um, Michelle, Gary, uh, and, every, and James and everyone else at the hospital. They've been fantastic at uh, really, really bringing this home. So it's been a true collaborative and a team effort and everyone should be really proud of it. We expect to have a couple hundred doses done by the end of the week, a few more hundred next week as we get our sea legs in and uh, we should be able to get through the step one of everyone in step one of phase two uh, completed by the end of next week, including homebound. Uh, tomorrow we will be doing all of the homestead. And then we are also going to be working on the homebound people for Landmark and Academy Hill and uh, the rest of the homebound group members who are not at those uh, congregate living facilities. Uh, and we should be able to get to all of our homebound people by next week as well. So the sign up surveys are still available. Um, please make sure you sign up on patient gateway. Keep an eye out for communications from both the town and the, and the hospital. Uh, if you aren't signed up for patient gateway, it is, it is easy to do. There's a step-by-step -step guide available on the Nantucket Cottage Hospital's website. Uh, you do not currently have to be a, a patient of the hospital in order to be able to sign up for the gateway. Um, and to get to the information, uh, we do have this phone number here. There's the sign up surveys are still on the town's website. If you want statewide vaccination information, you can go to mass.gov. And then if you are looking for the sign up info and anything from the hospital side, you can follow this QR code if you, uh, if you have your phone. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can go ahead and just scan this. Uh, it does still go to the sign up sheets there. Um, and then you, from there, you can get to all the other information regarding our vaccines. And uh, with that, I will call it a day and we'll go to any questions you may have. Melissa, then Jason, then Christy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Um, I'm really impressed with our community's um, ability to respond to the surge, and I'm, I'm happy to see such positive trending. I just want to, um, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I also want to bring caution that that doesn't mean that we should be relaxing on any of our mitigation efforts as a community, sure. but stay the course. Um, and as Super Bowl Sunday is coming up, this is a great reason for a lot of people to gather. And I just wanna 
urge our community members to um, remind them we do still have restrictions, gathering restrictions in place. Is that right, Roberto? Yes, the gathering restrictions are in place. And if you let me just step in one more thing. Of course. Nancy Midson saying I forgot, I, the biggest thank you as well to the VFW. Um, without them, we don't have a vaccine clinic. So that's a big one. That I'm Absolutely. Sorry so thank you, Amy, for reminding me that. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, with Super Bowl Sunday coming thing, we do still have our restrictions and our gathering restrictions in place. That is 10 per person. I mean, 10 per person, uh, <laughs> 10 people per gathering. Uh, and we are asking that you maintain it there. Uh, However, now that, you know, when you're really thinking about it, we live in New England, and since Brady's on the Buccaneers, I don't think any of us are going to be watching the Super Bowl anyway. Um, speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> and um, so with that in mind, um, and this may be a more appropriate or, um, question for the Board of Health, but um, do we, I, I'm not 100% clear on which orders we have where we're stricter than the state. Is there a uh, a timeline in which you think that we may get more aligned with the state in terms of their restrictions? We, that's a very good point. It's definitely for the Board of Health. Um, but uh, I realize that the, the gathering restriction, I think, is the only one that we have that's more strict than the okay. state. And that's only for outdoor gathering. I think the indoor gatherings at the state is still at 10. Okay. Um, the outdoor is at 25. We have 10 across the board. Uh, but other than that, I don't think we have anything more, anything that's stricter than the state. Okay, fabulous. It would be wonderful to, I think, a uh, signal to our community when we can say that we can be at least in line with the state restrictions. So I, I look forward to that conversation. Th those are all my questions for now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Jason, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Roberto, the, the BioBot test, very interesting that it can detect the variant. Will that, will that be three different tests we'll have to spin or will it be one test and they'll say, you know, one for the variant? One, how will that work? So we're still getting the, gathering the information right now. Um, but to my knowledge, it'll still be just the one sample that we collect that David's crew collects um, and sends off. And then they will be taking multiple samples from that sample and running, uh, it's still PCR uh, through there um, because what we're trying to do is just detect presence. Uh, not necessarily concentration yet. Um, and they will be testing for uh, the B117, which is, I believe, the UK variant. And they'll be testing for, Jericho, correct me if I'm wrong, E257 or something like that, which is the South African variant. E484K, it's actually the, um, the spike protein mutation that is also showing up in the UK variant. Thank you. So we have to memorize a couple of numbers here and letters. So many. Um, Christy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of questions and comments um, kind of going off of Melissa's comments about keeping our vigilance. I wanna make sure that families are thinking about February vacation and hopefully staying put this year to keep our community safe. Um, I don't know if the school has put out anything or the town, but it's something to start thinking about as we enter the month of February. Um, is both the stop the spread and the vaccines taking place at the VFW or has any locations changed? The locations have not changed uh, and the hours at the stop the spread are, have not changed either. It's still in the morning. So we have scheduled it so that stop the spread ends at around 10, 10 cleanup happens at 1030 and then the clinic starts at 11 a.m. Uh, so there is no interruption to the stop the spread at the VFW. And uh, you bring up an excellent point about uh, February and winter vacations. Uh, please do not travel. Um, tra uh, we're still, the world has still seen a large spike of COVID. We are at 470,000 deaths. Um, so it's, we're, and that's in the United States alone. Uh, so what we're, we're really seeing that it's the quickest way for the variants to get here. If you travel out, that's the easiest way to get the variants here. And I know Jericho wants to throw in on that too. 
Uh, and do remember the state of Massachusetts still has quarantine orders for everyone, anyone who crosses the state lines, punishable with up to $500 per day, and those must be observed. Uh, and that traveling during a time when new variants are arriving is flat out irresponsible. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And if there's anybody left in our community who wasn't vaccinated in phase one, what do we recommend they do? Anyone who is who qualifies for phase one? Okay. Yes. Because if you qualify for phase one and you didn't sign up for phase one while the phase one signups were open, signups are closed. But still sign up for phase two. Um, and we and that those lists we do check and update every day. It does ask, we do ask for occupation on there and employer in that second phase. So we would be able to flag them if we ever had to. Um, but phase one vaccinations were open for a significant amount of time. And just, and there's, this is actually a very good point that you bring up too. The governor reiterated today at his meeting and it's, and it was reiterated to us from the Department of Public Health. And then also the Department of Public Health reached out to the hospitals directly. If we willingly give a vaccine to somebody out of phase, they will cancel and suspend our site, our vaccination site. We have to pay attention to the state's phasing orders. So I know people are really upset about where they fall in the phases. We've had a lot of um, occupational representatives uh, reaching out to us of why am I not on phase one? We didn't set the rules for phase one, the state did. And we can, just because you signed up for phase one, thinking that you qualified for phase one didn't mean you actually qualified for phase one. We do have your information. We were just able to shift you over to phase two. And uh, you, you don't have to sign up again. If you've already signed up, we are just bringing them in as we have to, as the phases allow. Thank you. And one last question. Is it possible at all to keep a tracker of how many vaccines we've distributed on Nantucket or if, if that's something the hospital might be able to do? It, it is possible today. The clinic opened today. So we don't know how many, I, I don't know how many were given yet. Um, I will probably be giving that out in, uh, in aggregate numbers every Wednesday at the select board meetings. Um, I will I will work with the hospital to get those exact numbers, yes. I don't know if I'll be able to do it daily. Uh, the hospital might, but I don't know if they're willing to do it daily either. Um, but I think we will be able to do aggregate numbers weekly. Jericho? Uh, yes, and uh, just to speak to the um, uh, number of vaccinations done, uh, the comms plan for the hospital is to release that number once a week. I believe it's going to be on Friday, starting with next Friday, I believe, uh, as town's uh, off-site vaccination um, process moves ahead, we will also be keeping track of those and having an aggregate of all vaccinations done on the island. However, we're not going to be sharing the amount of vaccine arriving on the island because that, frankly, is not the kind of information we need to be sharing. It's like a bank telling how much money is in the bank. So, Did that get all of your questions, Christy? You're not muted. Um, I don't see any public hands raised. Do we want to move on to a task force update? Okay, so uh, as far as the COVID enforcement and outreach and education task force goes, I have three points to cover today. Uh, first is your uh, regularly scheduled COVID numbers update. Um, from the enforcement side, uh, we have a total of 288 field inspections. We visited 218 job sites. We have 71 total enforcement actions. Um, we still remain at 10 citations and 16 tips. Uh, we have 13 uh, requests for rules, clarifications, and uh, more accurate guidelines. Um, our second pass number is up to 31. 
Uh, and we have only shut down 11 job sites, which is a number I'm happy to say has not increased. Um, we're currently going to be reaching a stage where we're going to have to start dealing with a different set of uh, enforcement issues as the landscaping season moves up. So we're increasing the participation from natural resources, uh, and we're going to be moving on to a more um, area-based patrol uh, system as opposed to a specific job site visit. Um, as a result, I'll probably be revising my um, these kind of thumbnail metrics, uh, as well as kind of um, attempting to you know, introduce a little bit more granularity in certain measures of enforcement. Um, additionally, we're going to be um, uh, working um, you know, with the economic task force uh, that Melissa is running to kind of make sure we have uh, an established set of guidelines. Uh, and I'll be uh, reaching out to talk to you about that shortly, Melissa. Sorry to spring that on you right now. Um, second point, um, I just got out of the, um, you smell it, um, meeting with uh, Malcolm from the Board of Health. Um, there's a lot of very interesting, very robust discussion of the nitty gritty of how this would be deployed, um, the state of testing. Um, it doesn't yet look like something that's going to be available before the beginning of summer for any sort of wide-scaled application, but we are seeing a couple of very interesting potential use cases um, that could be, you know, um, rolled in with sort of, uh, you know, retail and home screening as well as self-screening. Um, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that there is uh, a very useful component to this that we can apply, um, but until we kind of have a, a little bit more robust discussion of the actual practical deployment measures, it's going to be a little bit um, before you actually start seeing the tests. Um, do, 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 oh, additionally, um, the COVID vaccination forms um, coming from uh, the, are reached through the town um, site. It's very important. Uh, there's nothing specific on the island yet, but I have seen reports of other municipal um, other municipal uh, boards of health and vaccine pages um, being uh, circumvented uh, by um, scammers, essentially. Uh, so be very careful on where the email comes from. Make sure you're only following a link to directly from uh, the uh, town web page and know that the town is never going to ask you to download anything, any file, any app, anything at all as part of this vaccination effort. So please be aware of scammers there. Uh, that I believe is just about everything for me. Um, it, does anyone have any questions regarding enforcement efforts or any outstanding vaccine sign-up related questions? Not seeing any questions. All right then, I think that more or less does it for me. Okay. Is there an, anything else new for the economic task force? Melissa? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, so Jericho, thank you. We are looking forward to coordinating with you. That was on my bullet point um, to say that we would love to continue scenario planning so that we can begin reaching out to our businesses um, and ensure there's um, solid communications about um, best practices for planning this season. Um, obviously, everybody understands that there's no definitive way we can give information about what life will be like at the end of April or May, but we would like to give them the tools to plan. So we're really excited about that, Jericho. Um, we are going to begin outreach next week to businesses. We have a, a little outreach plan, and that involves both the Chamber of Commerce, town resources, and some other um, areas um, of, of outreach. And we will be looking for businesses to give us feedback, ask questions, share their concerns about the upcoming season so that we can best represent them. Our email address is ACK task force at nantucketchamber.org. Um, that will be included in the outreach next week. But if for anybody who's listening tonight or watches later, if you would like to send us an email, um, please do so. And um, we will take your comments and con into consideration. We will um, also have, I hope by next week, some wonderful new business resources to announce, including the um, use of the fireworks 
fund money um, and how that can be allocated to best support businesses. I will also say that from the Chamber of Commerce perspective, the Rock Solid Grant Fund um, will have a second round and that will be open for application um, and throughout the month of March. And um, you can contact us at the chamber for more information on that. Um, and hopefully by the end of February, we'll also use our partnership with NCTV to produce some new small business updates. We don't imagine that the information is going to be coming at businesses as fast and as furiously as last spring. Um, so probably not a need for quite so many, but we do hope that they're informative. And again, this is all for the goal to give businesses the best tools and resources available to plan for the healthiest and most successful season possible. Um, oh, and uh, one last thing, we will also be updating our back to business toolkit, which um, resides on the town website. And that also is in hopes that businesses have access to clear signage and communication, front facing communication with the public that is contiguous among all the businesses. So lots of information that's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Very excited and very grateful. Thank you again to our small group of dedicated volunteers working with us on that. Any questions for me? Great. Thank you. Oh, Matt, hang on. Matt, you're muted still. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello, am I frozen? Yep. No, you got, we got you. Oh, you hear me good. All right. Th sorry, I was frozen. Melissa, how far have you gotten with uh, outside dining and closing streets sure. in your group? Sure. I'll let Amy take that question, but we've, we've gotten quite far, I think. But go ahead, Amy. Thank you. Um, we talked about our timeline. Um, we've worked through internally the application again because we are um, again allowed to do local approvals of this type of thing um, through the state, extended it through the state of emergency plus 60 days. So um, we have edited and developed that application again and that's going out probably tomorrow just to um, get all the plans from restaurants and such so we know where we are. Um, part of the timeline we discuss is coming to the board um, probably um, on the 17th to give an update as to where we are um, with that as well and plan on doing um, approvals and hearings in March with the select board um, so that we are ready to at least do our preliminary launch um, when seasonals are ready to come online beginning April 1st. Um, so we have that timeline together and I'll provide you with um, where we are at that meeting as well. And we're gonna have some more, we've had small group meetings and some more listening sessions with restaurants and other folks, obviously including retail and other folks in there as well. Um, I'll just say quickly, um, we've identified some things from last year, some bringing communications more consistent, um, some line cues and different things and resources for folks to um, better assist with that. So uh, the economic task force has been hugely um, helpful in focusing us uh, in that as well. So we will provide more updates and the restaurants will be able to start submitting those things um, tomorrow. Melissa. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add to that. And I think um, this will certainly be for the board to consider, but a lot of the feedback we are, we are hearing is that outdoor dining is successful and, and is there a policy consideration of this board um, and zoning to continue that in a more permanent way. Um, I think a lot of restaurants, um, restaurateurs are willing to invest in some of the infrastructure needs, nicer tables, nicer barricades, heat lamps, things like that to make the experience look um, nice and, and have it be more enjoyable if they know that it's something that they can depreciate over three to five years. So nothing for us to decide tonight, but I think that that is coming up and we should start to think about what those impacts would look like um, and what other considerations we'd have to take into account, such as parking, um, transportation, things like that. Thank you. Yes, we, we definitely need to be ahead of the, that conversation. And I think that the community does really 
want to see us try and incorporate some of the new experiences we've had. Melissa? Oh, thank you, Don. And I, I wouldn't be remiss to say that I, Amy mentioned it, but you know, retail is on the top of mind for our task force as well. We're not just focused on, on one industry, certainly. And although, you know, having, um, you know, pulling racks out onto sidewalks may be less likely, um, there is um, one, we think, and what we hear anecdotally, a lot of benefit to outdoor dining to retailers, um, number one. And so that's an economic incentive for us to, to consider continuing it. And two, we have some other great ideas about how to help retailers going forward, um, particularly in the shoulder season. So those will be coming out um, likely by Amy's group in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments tonight um, in regard to the um, COVID-19 agenda item? I'm not seeing any more hands. Thank you all very much. Um, we will move on to public comment for items not related to COVID-19 and otherwise not on our agenda for discussion. I do see one hand raised, um, Tobias Glidden. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just two um, items I just wanted to bring to the board's attention. I had a great meeting with uh, Pete Kaiser and Jeff Carlson and uh, Patrick from Julian Sears' office, and we talked about uh, moving forward with creating, you know, a, a three-mile buffer in some capacity uh, to to limit some of the impacts um, from commercial draggers around Nantucket. It's a home rule petition that the town put forward. Oof, maybe three years ago now. And I just wanted to bring it to the board's attention that it uh, would be helpful to resubmit that. Um, there's some strategy around how to get it passed and we're continuing to work on that front. Um, so just wanted to mention that. And then secondly, I just wanted to thank the select board for all their comments at last week's HDC uh, appeal for a nine genus drive in the context of solar. And I wanted to just you know, reiterate that I heard a lot of, at least in my mind, really positive feedback from the select board that we need you know, more reasonable solar on the island. And I would encourage the select board um, you know, with that sentiment in mind and along with the select board's you know, goals of more environmental stewardship to uh, put forward some sort of warrant article um, to enable that uh, on the island, working with the HDC to, to make it happen. I'm happy to help in any regards. I know the timeline is short, but the, uh, there was a nice amount of flooding yesterday downtown, so I'll just leave you with that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other public comments this evening? I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, there's no new business that I'm aware of. I'll move on to approval of minutes, um, treasury warrants, and tending contracts, um, except for the one that I noted earlier with Arcadis that will be on for next week. Are there any um, questions or changes to anything? Move approval. Matt? Okay, for all th one through three? Yes. I'll second. Okay, all the... Um, and just, just note that the Arcadis contract is not being voted on. Um, all those in favor by roll call, Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Jason Bridges. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Don Holgate, aye. That carries unanimously. Um, we will move on to presentations. And I'm going to hand this over to John Giorgio. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, actually, a few months ago now, the um, uh, the board, the select board, had a uh, meeting where we discussed um, um, various aspects of the PFAS contamination issue on the island. And um, as you know, we're awaiting the finalization of the report um, from Weston and, and Samson. And at that last meeting, there was a discussion about the select board considering uh, entering into a retainer agreement with a specialized law firm 
that could help the town pursue claims against the manufacturers of PFAS. Um, I'm not sure at the time this had happened, but the airport commission um, did quite a bit of um, due diligence and uh, determined um, that uh, they were going to sign a, um, an agreement uh, with the law firm, uh, basically with Hank Norton and his law firm. And uh, so we got in touch, in touch with Hank. We negotiated a proposed retainer agreement and Hank is here tonight to make a brief presentation to the select board about what his efforts would entail. Um, uh, if the board is so inclined, we have a retainer agreement ready to be signed, approved by me to move forward. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Hank who can do his introduction. Thank you, John. Go ahead, Hank. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. John, thank you for that introduction. And uh, to the members of the board, thank you uh, for allowing us to spend a little bit of time with you this evening. Uh, and I understand we've got a heavy agenda. So um, again, my name is Hank Naughton. I'm an attorney here in Massachusetts. I'm a managing partner of the Pub Public Client Service Group of the national firm, uh, Napoli Skelnick, uh, based in Manhattan, but with offices around the country, which specializes in environmental law. We are lead counsel in the multi-district litigation, uh, and I apologize, I'm actually in Washington right now for the, the sirens outside my hotel window. Um, we are the lead counsel in a multi-district litigation that has been consolidated in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, of litigation against the makers of PFAS and PFOA uh, with about 500 plaintiffs at this point, we represent about a quarter of those, those plaintiffs. Paul Napoli is uh, on the managing committee uh, directing, helping to direct that litigation. Um, our background uh, goes back 30 years in the area of environmental law and in these large scale tort class action uh, uh, litigation, we, we'd like to term the cost recovery and um, our bench is deep and wide uh, as far as our legal expertise is concerned um, with uh, more than 80 lawyers that, that are knowledgeable and involved uh, in, in, in cases like this. Um, what I, I think is a benefit to you, what I would respectfully suggest is you've got, you'll have local counsel with me being located in Massachusetts. Um, I was specifically brought on board uh, I'd been on council for a couple of years and came on board as a, as a partner uh, last year to open up our New England office, which I'm in the process of doing. Uh, we also have a very deep scientific background, and uh, I, I can answer more specific questions about the litigation itself and how it could benefit, getting involved can benefit Nantucket. Um, but I also have with me uh, Walter Hang, who is the executive director of Toxics Targeting, which is a group of scientists that we have on full-time retainer to work for our clients and take a look at the data affecting uh, your water district. Uh, we're proud to be working with and have worked with the airport commission, and we'd like to do the same with Nantucket itself. Uh, it Madam Chair, would it be appropriate this time to allow Walter to say a few words in regard to the research he's done, and then I can wrap up telling you a bit more about the litigation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'm Walter Hang. I'm the president of Toxics Targeting. Uh, Erica, I hope you can uh, get my uh, PowerPoint up. Uh, so Toxics Targeting has been around for about 30 years. And what we basically do is compile government data uh, and then we attribute those government data to spatial locations. So typically uh, we help many of the largest engineering and environmental consulting firms uh, in the nation. And our specialty is uh, drinking water protection. Next slide. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Go until you get to the first map. Keep going. 
keep going. Erica, I, I, that might have been a different attachment uh, to the email I sent you. It was two separate attachments. Give me one second, please. So basically, I've been helping Hank's firm compile <clears throat> environmental data on these per and polyfluoral alkyl substances all across the country. Uh, and so this is the contamination that basically has impacted drinking water on your lovely island. Uh, so the first time that these contaminants were identified was really circa 2015. So they've now been identified uh, hither and yon, and they're associated with things like Teflon, uh, cooking, uh, nonstick cookware, they're associated with Scotchgard, uh, stain master, it's on carpeting, it's on office furniture, sofas, everything you can think of. And so for the first time, uh, states, including Massachusetts, are beginning to adopt these maximum contaminant levels uh, to safeguard public health from PFAS in drinking water. And so Massachusetts has arguably the strictest standards anywhere in the country uh, because there are thousands of these PFAS compounds and they've adopted a limit of 20 parts per trillion total. That's 20 seconds in 32,000 years. So this contamination, that's not it. Uh, this contamination is extremely uh, toxic and it's very difficult to remove. So you would have seen a map of Massachusetts with PFAS contamination all across the state. You would have seen a map of Nantucket that shows that public drinking water has been contaminated. You would have seen a very detailed map of the airport. There are multiple places on the airport where aqueous film forming foam reportedly was used or dumped and this AFFF foam contains PFAS. So the PFAS is extremely persistent when it's released into the environment. And um, uh, the attorney referenced the Weston study that's underway. It's a very big national firm and they've identified pollution all over the airport and it's moving into the adjoining ocean. However, they've also concluded that they don't know where all of the pollution comes from. So if your uh, locality retains Hank's firm, uh, it's my understanding that as a courtesy, my firm would compile the data for Nantucket Island. And we know that you have some solid waste facilities, you have a lot of oil and hazardous material discharges and we would try to find out where all your PFAS contamination is coming from. And in that way, if there are potential responsible parties, they could be pursued for cost recovery uh, because the treatment to remove PFAS from drinking water is extremely expensive and you have to operate and maintain those systems typically for decades. Walter, thank you, and uh, and I'm sure that was uh, my fault about the, uh, the, the the email I sent. Erica had the the two different sets of slides, and I apologize to you, Erica. Um, and please feel free to share those uh, offline with uh, the members of the board and and the other appropriate uh, uh, personnel. So, as you can see, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, bench and a deep understanding of the PFAS uh, situation going on here in the in the Commonwealth, in Nantucket, and uh, and throughout the country. Specifically to Nantucket, um, we we feel uh, that the fact that we are representing the airport commission already is is a plus. That uh, the two uh, representing both the airport commission and the town. Uh, will be uh, will dovetail quite well because a lot of the it, a lot of the same information it's going to be a lot of the same information uh, and uh, and so it will save us time in preparing that. What's and uh, uh, so just to, to be clear, we're not suing the airport. We're suing on behalf of the airport. The 
defendants are the makers of the PFAS, P, uh, PFOA um, elements, the chemicals. Uh, and there's about 15 different defendants. And I think I've provided a copy of the lawsuit, uh, the original complaint to John. And if I haven't, I will, and, and it can be shared. Um, and they're national and international firms uh, that our cause of action feels uh, that they were aware for upwards of potentially 50 years of the cancer causing effects of PFAS and PFOA, uh, uterine cancer, testicular cancer, uh, uh, glioblastoma, uh, multiple, multiple myeloma, uh, numerous different types of cancer uh, that we are discovering more and more as we do more research into this. What is the goal of the, of the litigation? It's cost recovery. Uh, our purpose, and uh, we feel we're in a very strong position, is to try to get the makers to the table prior to trial uh, to provide uh, a settlement which would be put into a trust fund, which communities like yourself that have been impacted could then apply to uh, for, um, for funding to remediate the, um, uh, the impact upon your water systems. And uh, that's again where Walter uh, and our staff would come in uh, and work directly with you uh, to help you come up and to quantify the numbers, to quantify what we feel the damages uh, to your system are and what it would take, uh, the money figure that it would take to fix your system. Uh, and we feel we're in a very strong position to do that. Uh, as, as John will tell you, there's never any guarantee uh, that we won't have to go to trial, uh, but uh, indications are that uh, we may be able to avoid that. And that uh, honestly, there's strength in numbers. The more systems that sign up and join with us, uh, we feel the more pressure on the, on the defendants, uh, on the makers of, of these products that are, that are causing cancer. Uh, we'd like to do that for Nantucket. We'd like to work with you uh, going forward and, and help you uh, quantify your numbers, come up with a plan for remediation uh, and help you, help you get there. Uh, you know, part, part of this is to, to let you know a bit about our firm. I think I've told you a little bit already. Uh, myself uh, will be, you know, is, uh, is local. Uh, Paul Napoli, Hunter Skulnick, Marie Napoli, among the most um, uh, trusted and, uh, and, and, and prolific and successful uh, large-scale trial lawyers in the country. <clears throat> We've got uh, Walter, uh, who provides tremendous scientific backup. And we also have a significant communications department. Um, many, many communities that become involved need help with developing their narrative to speak to their ratepayers, their taxpayers, and their citizens. I have to tell you, I've been incredibly impressed uh, with your board and with your, uh, with, with your municipal uh, personnel tonight. I don't know if you would need our help with that. I, I, something tells me you can, you, you can handle yourselves and speak for yourselves very, very well, but, but communities have needed our, our help in explaining this uh, to, to their community members. So we feel we come to you with a full bench of, of, uh, of resources that could help you get to success uh, in this lawsuit. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to answer some questions at this point. I, I could talk about PFAS from now till nine o'clock tonight, but you, you don't wanna hear me do that. Um, uh, so if you have, really have some specific questions uh, that, that could help inform your decision here, I'd, I'd appreciate getting those. Thank you, Hank. Does anyone have any questions? Jason? Yeah, uh, this might be for John, Giorgio too. What's, is there any downside? Is there, you know, I read the, the you know, the agreement or the resolution and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit over, it's a bit of legal, legalese, but, you know, the, the liens and stuff like that, are there other uh, litigations that we don't be a part of and we couldn't? Is there, is there anything that we need, we need to think about on the downside? I don't, I don't see any, but I just want to check. So I can help answer that question. That question, Jason. Um, the the town is not unfamiliar with these kinds of legal arrangements, as you know. The town is participating in the opioid litigation through a similar type of retainer agreement. Um, we also have the Vineyard Win situation, and um, I think it's important to emphasize that there there's no financial cost to the town in pursuing this litigation. 
Um, Hank and his firm make the money when and if they reach a settlement or a judgment in court. And uh, they will uh, retain 25% of whatever, um, whatever recovery the town achieves. The, um, the agreement is pretty standard format. Um, it, uh, again, it doesn't require the town to make any upfront costs. Um, to the extent that, that their firm would have to uh, borrow money, for example, to hire experts and to conduct the litigation, you know, they, there are costs that they incur, which would be deducted from the, um, from the settlement. So um, I, I do have a question for Hank, however, which I'm happy to wait until the other board members have asked questions or I can ask it now. Madam Chair, can I ask? I would go ahead. I, I think that that answered Jason's question. Okay, great. So, so Hank, if the board decides to sign on, uh, what would be the next steps in terms of joining the litigation? How would that work? Thanks, John. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, we would draft a complaint specific to Nantucket uh, and eventually make a decision as to whether or not we file it in uh, federal district court in Massachusetts and then immediately uh, move to, to remove it to the multi-district litigation right. in, um, in, in Charleston. Um, we, or there is, there is a mechanism by which we could apply directly to Judge Gergel in Charleston uh, to add Nantucket as a, uh, as, as a plaintiff um, and, and not have to go through uh, the district court in, in, uh, right. in, in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, that, uh, I, I, I think that might be the route we'd go. I don't want to talk to Paul Napoli, who's literally on the ground there in Charleston uh, cons consistently uh, to get his view. The, I don't think it would help here. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the, the town, we just got a settlement of $15.7 million uh, for this town of Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Peshtigo, Wisconsin. They are a plaintiff to the MDL, uh, but uh, one of their main industries uh, in the town causing this pollution was the Tyco Corporation. And uh, because so they had, they had a lot of local knowledge where they could point at Tyco uh, as a PRP, a potentially responsible party. And based on the potential threat of a, the local uh, filing locally, Tyco decided to go separately and settle with that town. Uh, so in that, in that instance, it proved uh, a good idea to file locally. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in this instance, we, you know, we don't anticipate really on behalf of Nantucket or really for any of the about a dozen or 15 communities we're currently representing in Massachusetts, we're gonna be able to point to one single local uh, PRP, local industry that we could say, you did it. Um, you know, come talk to us now, separate and apart from the MDL. So uh, long, long answer to your question, John, but it's likely we would move to uh, bring Nantucket as, as quickly as possible into the MDL in Charleston. Okay, and uh, Jason, just to follow up on your question. Um, so I don't know that I would classify this as a downside, but um, the attorney's gonna need help from the town uh, in terms of putting the case together and responding to discovery, et cetera. We, we did a fair amount of work on the opioid litigation, putting together what's known as a plaintiff's fact sheet that had a lot of statistical information. Um, and I would imagine that there will be some staff resources that will have to assist counsel in preparing the case. Thank you, John. Um, Christy, I'll go to you, and then I do have a public question from Bruce Mandel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this question is probably more geared towards John. Um, you mentioned that the airport commission has hired Hank's firm, and I'm wondering if the town signs on, will we both move forward, or would the airport drop off, or how would that work? Um, you know, the, the, air, the airports are pretty independent entities. I'm sure Tom is on the line. He would attest to that. I would anticipate that there would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, Hank, that there would be separate complaints filed. 
but they would all be consolidated in that multi-district litigation. Yes. That's what I would anticipate would happen here. John's right. That, that's exactly correct. Thank you. Um, shall I go to Bruce Mandel now? Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can. I hope I've unmuted successfully. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have several points. I would like to address them and then have the presenters uh, respond rather than go through them one at a time. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Walter and Hank for this uh, presentation. It's very clear, and uh, I'm appreciative. Um, during this presentation just now, I believe Walter mentioned that uh, the public drinking water uh, has been established as being contaminated here, and I don't necessarily think that's... Uh, so to the levels where we need to be alarmed, at least from the public water company. Uh, so I'd like him to clarify that when I'm finished. And also, Hank, you mentioned that the uh, UCLs have been adopted by the state. And uh, I'm concerned about that statement a little bit because I've been after the DPW to uh, sample the uh, ground sampling wells, uh, groundwater sampling wells, uh, for PFAS for a number of years, uh, for a reason that I'll explain in a moment. Uh, but they have not tested because um, the state's MCL thresholds uh, have been in draft form. And therefore, since they're not in final form, uh, there's no requirement for the, the test, so they're not going to sample. So I'd like you to briefly <clears throat> explain that uh, statement. Um, and the, the reason I'm interested in this is that uh, there have been a subtle, several developments over the years. I, I became a victim of multiple myeloma, as did several uh, others in the, my neighborhood. And there have been other cancer uh, clusters in, along my street where every home has had a misadventure with the various forms of cancer over the years. And we are down gradient from the landfill. Uh, and Long Pond is a groundwater source, which is the buffer between us and the landfill. So I've been after this uh, in order to find out what's going on. And recently I tested my own well with a certified lab in Massachusetts where two PFAS elements were detected. I contacted DEP to see if they would help me determine the source of that contamination. And unfortunately, Nantucket is not on the list of uh, counties that can receive that kind of help from uh, the Mass DEP. And when I challenged that, they said, well, you know, there's a, an individual form, or if I had documentation, uh, that might influence them to change that decision, uh, I should send it along, which I did. Um, we know that uh, there are PFAS-containing materials in the landfill, online cells and line cells from decades of accepting those materials as Walter was listing the various materials, carpeting and flying pans and other things and cosmetics that have been going into landfill. Uh, so we're concerned about that. And of course, the sludge, the dewatered sludge from the wastewater treatment plant is processed uh, partially at the landfill. So um, overall, can the scope of work being performed by Walter's firm and Hank's firm include Madiket, the landfill, and the potential contamination of the wells there. Many of the homes do not have access to town water. Uh, and have found out, unfortunately, that because of the cost of the test for determining if your well water has PFAS elements, it's expensive. So people have been reluctant, and I think somewhat fearful, to find out what's there. So. Those are my comments and I'd appreciate any responses. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so I'll go to Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I will, so let me address the MCLs. Um, on October 1st of last year, Bruce, uh, DEP uh, adopted an advisory status, uh, the 20 parts per trillion that Walter articulated. Uh, that is it, it, advising the cities and towns of the Commonwealth to, that they should start testing their water and that anything above a 20 parts per trillion uh, would be suspect. That is an advisory status until October 1st of 2021 of this year when the testing will become mandatory. Uh, DEP is, uh, has provided some funding for testing of municipal wells and water supplies. And we've worked with numerous communities to make sure uh, that they've gotten that funding, that the testing overall is, is not incredibly uh, uh, costly or expensive, at least for a municipality. I don't know that they are working with individual well owners uh, for that <laughs> testing. Uh, and it's something we can certainly, um, you know, certainly talk to DEP. We, we speak to DEP on a pretty consistent and pretty regular basis. Um, so, and then jumping to your last question in regard uh, to that landfill and the potential contamination there, and that could that be part of the scope of work, that would be part of uh, the research that we would do, that Walter would do, uh, and that we would work with the town personnel to, um, to determine the damages there and determine the testing there that we would use to help quantify uh, the damages to remediate uh, the water supply uh, on the island. Uh, so um, it, it all would be, all, all potential sources of contamination would be examined to help us quantify uh, your damages and to try to, uh, to, to, try to uh, recover those damages on behalf of the island. Um, and, and I hope that answers kind of the, the legally oriented end of things here. Uh, but I want to give Walter a chance to comment on the scientific uh, uh, aspects of, the, of your questions, Bruce. Thank you for that question. Uh, we've been doing a great deal of work on these ancient uh, solid waste landfills, particularly on Long Island. And so many of these sites were neither designed, constructed, nor maintained to hold their contents securely. Uh, and, and so in an area like uh, Nantucket Island, where there's a great deal of precipitation, uh, over the course of many years, that rain and snow can percolate through the layers of buried debris, and then the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances can leach out and then they can enter the groundwater system and they can migrate uh, in a basically down gradient plume. So if you had seen my map of the uh, airport, you would have seen where the monitoring wells have been established. You can see where they haven't been established. And if you had seen my map of the island as a whole, you would have seen where those landfills are located. Uh, so this is a prime concern. Um, and I'm not speaking for the law firm, I'm not promising, but very likely there are available data for that site. Toxics targeting, we try to compile them, make them available both uh, to the locality and to the law firm. That's all strictly confidential. You'll have to decide how best to proceed. But again, these emerging contaminants uh, didn't require cleanup, but there is a regulatory proceeding that's underway. And once those maximum contaminant levels are finally adopted, then a great deal of additional investigation, remediation, and treatment could ensue. That's exactly what's happening in other states, notably New York. Um, Bruce, I see you have your hand up again. D did that answer your questions? Do you have a follow-up? Thank you. Uh, it did answer some of those questions. And of course, um, there's a lot of concern uh, about moving forward expeditiously. And while I have the ears of the uh, select board, as you are going forward with reviewing the budgets for the upcoming year, um, 
we noticed that the budget for the landfill enterprise fund contains no funding for expanding the semi-annual groundwater surface water well testing to include the possibility to test for PFAS. And I would encourage you that in this approval process that you make an effort to modify that budget so that a small amount of money could be included for uh, sampling and testing for PFAS uh, going forward, especially if as uh, uh, Hank mentioned, the MCLs are going to be finalized uh, in just a few months and the excuse for not sampling hopefully will go away. Uh, so I want to encourage the five select board members to take that effort. I've also asked FinCom to uh, do that in their review. And I appreciate the efforts that are being made by the town uh, not to sweep this PFAS issue, uh, its broad extent over the island uh, under the uh, PFAS coated carpeting, so to speak but uh, to embrace the fact that we know that these elements are in the wastewater treatment sludge and we know that they're in the landfill and we must do something about it. Uh, the, cancer, the cancer issue is of course personally uh, important, but uh, these drinking water wells near the landfill need to be tested and I believe you may find a link between all of these uh, cancers nearby uh, and the contaminants. And uh, I hope we can do something to put an end to it. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, is the, does the board have further questions? Could we move forward? Um, do, is everyone comfortable? Need Sign motion. Okay. Motion, Jason? You need a motion? Yes. Yeah, motion to approve. Oh, second. second. Do we ha need any specific wording, John? Yeah, I think the motion should be to authorize the uh, chair to execute the retainer agreement. I'll make that motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Second. Thank you. All those in favor by roll call. Christy Parentella. Aye. Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Matt Fay. Aye. Don Holgate, aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, and I think we can address the budget question when, when we get to the budget later tonight. Maybe Brian can help answer that. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. John, uh, for your help, we look forward to working with you. And uh, John has my contact information. As I said, I, I take pride in the fact that I'm local and uh, uh, we can you know, communicate uh, at any any time that uh, your board needs information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. The, the PFAS issue. And I will, Erica, I apologize. I, I think that that was on my end that I didn't get you Walter's slides and I will get them to you uh, uh, very shortly so you can um, uh, share them with the board. Walter works very hard on these things. He's very proud of them. And that's on me for not, uh, if, if, if I didn't get them to you in my email. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I mean, th this is clearly an issue that we're taking very seriously and I'm glad we could move this forward tonight. Um, consent items. We have two gift acceptances. Does someone want to make a motion to accept and give send letters of thanks? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor by roll call. Jason Bridges. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. John Holgate, that carries unanimously. Um, next up, we have uh, two public hearings for transfer of licenses. Um, I will open public hearing number one and turn it over to Amy Baxter. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, these two transactions are both uh, liquor license transfers. Um, they were pushed from an earlier date in January. We need to update the LLC uh, advertisement and a better notification, which was done um, prior to tonight. So this is, as we just did recently, another liquor license transfer. Um, it's a transfer to a new LLC with some new um, ownership. The difference here in this case is there are some original an original owner and um, people still involved in this. This is not a complete transfer to a new entity. Um, it is a business uh, financial transaction and it's required by the ABCC. Um, all requirements have been made. Um, I believe this first one is for Lola Burger at One Sparks Avenue. It's a seasonal wine and malt beverages restaurant license. Um, and again, seasonals are valid beginning April 1st, January 15th. So there's no issue with it currently operating. Um, and in this case, there is a change of manager um, to Heather Wyant and all of the requirements are in. There's no objections to this transfer. Um, all requirements have been met thus far. Um, and those financials would be reviewed by the ABC um, if approved. Their attorney, Brian Swain, is here if there are any questions. Are there any questions? This is a public hearing. If there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak, I'm not seeing any hands. I'm not seeing any questions from the board. I'm going to close the public hearing. Can we go to a vote? Motion. Motion. Second. All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. John Holgate, aye. Um, number one carries unanimously. And then I believe we have the same thing for Lula 41, but di um, different new manager. Matt? Just a question. And I don't know if it's in the application. Mm -hmm. It noted, uh, are you an American citizen? And is that a requirement for these, for a liquor license? Uh, is a requirement, that's probably under the liquor license manager. Um, it is a requirement. Um, they are required to provide a passport or a citizenship uh, birth certificate for a liquor license manager. Okay, because the second one was answered no, answered in the negative on that question. Will that have an impact on this? And on which one, Brian, is there one? I didn't notice a no answer on that under a liquor license manager? Because we have passports. Okay. Sorry, I didn't I'll, see that either. Yeah, we, we went through this a couple times. I'm hoping, I don't know if it's under one of the LLC managers or directors. I don't believe that's a requirement. It has to be, um, well, package stores has a 50% or more ownership uh, for state residents, but that's not the same with an on-premise location. It would just be the liquor license manager that has to be a citizen. And I, and I believe and I, I would just, I, I don't have it right in front of me because I've got you guys up and I'm mm -hmm. kind of old and don't know how to do this stuff. But uh, just take a look at it, Brian, because I think it did say you maybe it was filled in incorrectly. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Is it, it looks like everyone is listed as a U.S. citizen, but not everyone is listed as a mass resident. I see the same thing. Yeah. They don't have to, they're just a U.S. citizen. Package store is the only one with a 50% or more mass resident requirement. So should be okay. Um, we do have the passport and all that, but we will double check to make sure that's correct. Thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this application? I'm not seeing any hands. Can I close the public hearing and go to a vote? Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor by roll call. Jason Bridges. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. John Holgate, aye. That, uh, I'm sorry, Matt Fee. <laughs> Did I skip you? Aye. <laughs> um, John Holgate, aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Thank Brown. You. Thank you. Um, town manager's report. Um, Lib Libby is off tonight, but we do have the review of proposed um, 2022 general fund 
budget amendments, potential for 2021 annual town meeting warrant articles for affordable housing trust fund. Uh, why don't we start with Tucker? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, following the select board directive for funding the Affordable Housing Trust for FY22. Uh, as you are all aware, a work group was established by the town manager, which included the town manager herself, uh, select board member, Christy Parentella, finance director, the chair of FinCom, the real estate specialist, myself, uh, housing director, and town council. After exploring uh, various approaches for funding the trust, the work group is recommending funding as follows, 475,000 in the general town budget uh, toward operational requirements and a separate $7.5 million override for what we term safe harbor maintenance. And this would serve incomes uh, between 30 and 200% uh, AMI. As the board is aware, the trust is in the midst of deploying the capital appropriated at the 2019 town meeting to assist in addressing the significant shortfall of suitable, stable, affordable year-round housing and in furtherance of the town's subsidized housing inventory state requirements alongside the select board's strategic goal of remaining in safe harbor. And there are a number of um, initiatives which we are uh, presently advancing. Um, we're looking forward to talking about them in more detail uh, in the near future. Um, but the money is appropriated at the 2019 annual town meeting. Um, while initially, uh, one might say, had the intention uh, to serve perhaps one year of safe harbor, we believe are going to end up contributing to uh, two or three years, perhaps beyond. Um, so the uh, $475,000 request is, as I mentioned, toward operational support, um, a, a additional staff member for the housing office, as well as maintenance of programs like our closing cost assistance program, consultants we work with and so forth. Um, with regard to the 7.5 million, um, that number is arrived at um, looking at the potential need for local subsidy for the development planned for the 135, 137 Orange Street site, which is the site that we are planning to address our safe harbor needs roughly three years hence. However, we need to know that that subsidy is there on the front end because the planning and procurement process and seeking a developer to do that project obviously starts well in advance of that three-year mark. Um, Brian Turbot is also uh, here tonight and I believe uh, Denise Cronow, I would invite them to add any comments they have, but maybe at this point I would um, open it up uh, after they comment to questions. Thank you. Brian. Um, <clears throat> I only have one comment relative to this. I just want to clarify that the seven and a half million dollars would be a debt exclusion. It would not be an override because that would permanently raise the levy limit. And that's not the way that this is proposed. It would be proposed as a debt exclusion, which is what we did with the, the $20 million 20, that we was authorized in 2019. Thank you. Denise, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, Dawn, not at this time. I mean, when it comes in, into the warrant discussions at FinCom, we'll, we'll discuss it then. But no, I was in on the meetings and I understand the logic behind them. Thank you. Um, board members? Okay, I mean, I'm assuming they're looking for some direction on whether we, we support this approach. Matt? Yeah, I, I asked some questions earlier today. You know, I had wondered why, you know, four four fifty versus, you know, wouldn't that wouldn't that amortize seven million? But I understand that's for operations, so I get that now. My concern is, I think, uh, alongside the article, I think politically we may have an issue at town meeting, 
And I think that the reason that's from people I'm hearing, I'm older, I'm probably dealing hearing from older people. Uh, but I think that I'm concerned that there'll be some uh, pushback because of the land bank article and some blowback onto housing. And so I'm concerned about asking for a debt exclusion. You know, if we could find a way to do it without the debt exclusion, I think that would be uh, better politically. I, I, I agree with the 450. I'd like to see, you know, I, I like uh, Arthur Reed's article. Uh, if we could figure out a percentage on that, that to me would be a better solution. But, you know, but I'm supportive of just, I'm just concerned. Melissa? Uh, thank you, Don. Um, Matt, I agree with you. I, I love the fact that we are going to have a lot of good options to debate at town meeting about how to fund our affordable housing trust fund and to meet our strategic goals. I'm concerned that the goal will get lost in the politics and debate by having um, some so many different options that could frankly be working against each other. So I support this. Um, I, I want to see it on the town meeting floor. Um, but politically, I'm also a bit concerned about the, the competitiveness of the, the other articles. And um, it would be great if we could pick a path. <laughs> but um, so that those are just just my thoughts initially. Thank you. Uh, Matt, then Jason. Yeah, no, and that's and that's what I would hope that we would do is is show leadership and pick the a path that is uh, most likely to result in success. Because I, you know, if we end up in a situation where there's less certainty, then there's less certainty, and we may not like the answer that town meeting gives us. We've all been there when something starts to go sideways, and then everything goes sideways for a while. This is too important to have that happen. Jason? Matt, listen, you make really good points. I haven't, I, I was looking at it in a different way. I, I think people like menu uh, options. I think there's an opportunity because these are two citizen Warren articles, right? It's no, there's nothing coming from the town. So what are we going to put out there that shows that, that we're going to, you know, commit? I think the 450 or 475 is a good start. I think we should do that for you know, make a commitment for three years, uh, a policy, we can always change it, go up or down, but I think it shouldn't just be this year. But I, I think if we can do it really well and communicate it, it's okay, this is what the town and select board and affordable housing trust is, is proposing. Here are two citizen warrant articles. Here's the advantages and disadvantages of all three of them. And I think people I want to give the benefit of the doubt to the voters that they can figure this out, that they can see the advantages and disadvantages. We've got till June to explain it. And I, so I support it, um, but I do see how it could get confusing and it could be blowback, but I, I like the idea of offering these three options. It really gets the discussion going on housing and how there's a lot of different ways to solve it. And I don't love all three of them perfectly, but they all have merits. And I, I think we owe that to the voters to have that conversation. Erica? I just wanted to clarify, the two articles that are being proposed are not citizen warrant articles. These are asking for board the board to sponsor them. The only I, citizen warrant article I, is Brooks. I think he meant Brooks article and Arthur Reed's article. Was that what you were referring to, Jason? Correct. Okay, because you said three. Yeah. So it made me confused. Oh, I was saying three kind of three paths, right? That's what I meant. Yeah, um, I would I would just add that um, we'll need to have the the data um, probably from you, Brian, on um, what this does to the tax bills, and um, and what kind of debt is falling off this year as we're asking for these um, these big debt exclusions. Um, Brooke Moore has her hand raised. Oh, Christy, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I kind of was in the subgroup, so I wanted to hear from the rest of the board before kind of chipping in. Um, but I'm in favor, of course, of the 475, and I liked Jason's 
idea of committing it for several years. Um, I do think that having several different options on the table and you know maybe having all of them go to town meeting is the best way to see kind of how the voters want to fund affordable housing. Another thing that is still on the back burner that we've been working on for years is the housing bank bill at the state legislature. So you know there's I think there's a couple of chances that you know if we were to approve one path as long as there's a sunset clause, we might have another funding source in a couple of years or, you know, if successful, maybe a couple of months if we were optimistic. Um, but I think we just want to look at all of those options. And again, as we've all been saying, the pros and cons of each one. So thank you. Thank you, Christy. We, and we do, we do have a meeting with our state reps um, for some strategy on the housing bank bill. Um, Brooke and then Rick Atherton has his hand up as well. Brooke Moore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as the sponsor of one of the citizens artic uh, warrant articles regarding the um, diversion of a portion of the land bank fee to affordable housing, my inspiration for filing that warrant article was a persistent um, issue with a, a commitment from the community um, on an ongoing basis for funding an effort that is critical to our community's future. And I'm delighted that we're gonna have the opportunity to discuss, debate, and look at the pros and cons of various funding mechanisms for affordable housing. I feel as though we, we may have turned a corner as a community from should we fund affordable housing to how are we gonna fund affordable housing? And um, that a commitment to doing so long-term is we're, we're getting there. And I think the voters, um, the, the idea, I think Jason used the word menu. I think it's, it's important because none of these funding mechanisms is, is perfect in that um, I've learned now that I'm in, in the public policy arena more and more that the choices we make as a community are relative to other choices. The, the, the funds are not unlimited. And we as a community have to make choices about relative priorities. They rise and fall and change over time. And I'm delighted that affordable housing is being elevated as a higher priority in these conversations around funding sources and look forward to weighing the pros and cons of the various options. And I just wanna thank the select board for your commitment um, to bringing this alternative to the table. And I just wanted to say that they, they all, each of the alternatives has uh, positives and negatives that we all can um, discuss in the months coming forward. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. I'll go to Rick Atherton next. Oh, there we go. Am I unmuted, Dawn? Yep. All right, thank you. Um, just, just a couple of observations. And I have uh, not had a chance to go through your package in detail. Um, so let me just start with, I was closely involved and instrumental in the $20 million that was approved a couple of years ago. And I supported that because I believed that we needed to protect our neighborhoods from 40 Bs. And I think what you need to do in your detailed information flow is to make sure we all understand the unit counts. It's not just dollars and how we're proceeding on the shy list year by year. Um, I didn't see that in your package. Maybe I missed it. And that leads sort of into a general observation, which um, some may not appreciate, but let me be quite clear. When the town reaches 10% and meets the state guidelines, I think the board needs to be upfront and clear with the electorate, the voters, about what their intention is on using public dollars to continue to support or subsidize affordable housing. If we meet the 10% guideline in the state, it may be time that public dollars don't need to be committed in the same way they were to get free of the 40B 
problem. I don't know the answer to that exactly. I may have my own personal thoughts, but I think the board needs to deal with that openly with the community so they understand where we're headed. Thank you. Um, Christy? Thank you, Madam Chair. If I could just respond to Rick, I think it's a really great point to keep thinking about the future and how we're going to keep focusing on affordable housing. And once we get to that 10%, we can, you know, kind of have that sigh of relief that we don't have the threat of a 40B, but that doesn't stop us from pushing forward with affordable housing because in 2030, we'll have another census and we need to keep building each year to make sure we don't get behind. Um, when I say building, I just mean continue to add to the shy list. Um, so we don't get behind so that in 2030, we're not in the same um, part where we're again behind the 10% and we have a threat of a 40B. So yes, we can have that sigh of relief that we did it and celebrate the fact that we got to 10%, but I don't think that that means that the work is at ending. Thank you. Yep, and, and the board has been fairly clear about discussing what next steps would be for other income levels and how other categories can be supported. And some of that is even as simple as the down payment, the, um, the closing cost assistance program. Um, Tucker and then Matt. Um, I just I wanted to thank Rick for the bringing up the number uh, where we are at on the shy. Um, presently, we have 232 units that would be considered to be on our subsidized housing inventory list, which would represent 47% of the goal at present until the decennial census that was conducted in 2020 produces our new goal. Matt? And I'll, I'll go quick. I, I think our goal shouldn't be to hit exactly 10%. We need a buffer. So that we, you know, and I've talked to Tucker about this. We need a buffer for the for what Tucker and for what Christie has said. You don't want to get to the next census, and you know we're we're fortunate. Well, we're unfortunate because we're losing a year on housing, but it makes getting to shy easier. But that if that turns around, then we will be needing more. And the other thing I think people have to realize, big picture, is ten percent of our year-round housing isn't nearly enough to have a community. You know, places that have worked on this longer aim for 30% or more of their total housing stock in some sort of uh, some sort of affordability or some sort of restricted category. Otherwise, it'll all be uh, it'll all be bought, bought by uh, seasonal. It'll all be investment homes. So, you know, I think that we are into this for a while, in my opinion. And you know, I think it's it, how do you do it? in a way that, you know, in the long term, how do you do it in a way that isn't only costing dollars from the taxpayers every year? Can you set up something that's a land trust model or some other model that is self-funding? Those are the areas that we really need to be heading. You know, this is the priority right now, but long term, it needs to be, you know, quite a bit different. Um, this is all really good discussion. I'll, I'll go to you, Melissa. But I, I just do want to bring it back to the original question. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I just want to, to that original question, I think Matt just touched on something that um, initially was a concern of mine. And I do thank Rick for bringing it up that, you know, we're not going to find our way out of this solution with public dollars only and finding that I, and taxpayer dollars only. And so, you know, I do love the menu options of some of these other solutions that citizens have brought forward and perhaps we're looking at some kind of combination for future funding mechanisms so that we can really you know invest what we need to invest now to get to where we need to be but then also be working on building another funding mechanism like you said like a land trust or something like that model that will continue to fund this in perpetuity i, I think this has been an issue on nantucket for decades and we're only just starting to see some progress and resolve, but we are at the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, and um, I think we need to find solutions that are long-term commitments, not just short-term solutions, and then walk away when we hit a, a target. Um, Rick, did you have a brief follow-up? And then I was just going to hope to move forward with the rest of the warrant. 
Uh, Don, I will quickly. I appreciate Matt's comment um, because I think there will have to be a transition at some point. And I think we need to be clear, we have lots of other affordable housing on the island that just doesn't count. Many employers already provide housing, including Mr. Fee, NIR and others, substantial housing, workforce housing that presumably is affordable and they're providing it as a matter of their economic decisions to run their businesses. And the problem with the shy list is they don't count. So we need to understand that our commitment to affordable housing as a community in that broader context is already well beyond just providing public support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we could debate. We could debate this all night. There's a lot more to discussion to be had. Um, but for, for right now, I'm seeing a consensus to put these two articles on the warrant. Yes? Okay. Um, and then we are going to continue with the discussion of the rest of the warrant under item number two. Matt? Before, and before we go, I would like us as a board to at some point prior to town meeting discuss whether we have a, a preference in this because I think I think if I still, I, I'm very concerned. I'm fine with this going on. I'm not particularly fine with, you know, giving a menu and try, you know, and, and figuring that town meeting will get it right. If, it, if town meeting's in a good mood and the right tone is set, they'll get it right. If it's, you know, depending who speaks first and what kind of night it is, the whole thing could be thrown out. So I think that we need to, as a board, if we, if we have a consensus, we should, you know, make that known early. And often. Well, I mean, I guess my question for you all tonight is, do you support this approach? Because that, that's, this is the one that is sponsored by us. Um, I think we've already had some valuable discussion on um, Brooks, Brooks' proposal to change the land bank fee structure, which we'll, we'll continue to have that discussion um, as the finance committee will. And um, and then we, we did have actually quite a bit of board discussion of, in regard to the stabilization fund. And we had some concerns that it would that it's difficult to take the money out. It doesn't allow the same degree of being nimble in purchasing properties. But um, I, di I do have a question for John on that. If you, do, if you do a stabilization fund for affordable housing, can every year you just plan to transfer those funds into the affordable housing trust fund or do you have to know specifically what they're going towards? No, you could, um, <clears throat> you could appropriate the money to the affordable housing trust. I think that's consistent with the, the concept, which is that it's an affordable housing fund. Um, it will require, of course, a two thirds vote of town meeting to do that each year. So the money would automatically go in and then it would be a two thirds vote to move Correct. to the affordable housing trust fund. Okay. Correct. So, um, I mean, I think we should maybe put this on a little bit more specific for our next discussion on the warrant to, to discuss these issues um, in terms of comparing. Does that make sense, Matt? Yeah, no, I think it does because I'm not sure that if we were doing Arthur Reed's article or some variation with a you know a more meaning a bit maybe a bit lower number so we're not crowding out other things. We might do we need the same uh, two thirds stabilization vote? Um, well, regardless of the percentage that you vote it, uh, on um, Arthur's article, it will it's going to the same place, and so it will still need a two thirds vote to appropriate it out. Okay, so right now we have consensus to add these two to the warrant. And um, let's, oh, if ahead. I may, Dawn, I'm sorry. I just wanted to point out one other thing about the stabilization fund. When you vote that dedication, um, you cannot change it for three years. So you, you wanna be sure you get it right the first time around. Um, that's Thank in the you. law. We, we can't amend the percentage for three years. <clears throat> but we can amend the percentage on town meeting floor. 
Oh yes, you could mo make a mo well. That would be Sarah's, um, the moderator's right. call. But I, you know, I would think if you're reducing it, I'm guessing she would say it was within the scope. Okay, thank you, John. <clears throat> I'm afraid that might be Brian's concern in regard to that. But um, but anyway, let's so let's move on. We'll put that on so we can do um do a comparison between all of the housing articles as a board discussion. Thank you. Um, and um, thank you, Tucker. And now let's, um, I don't know if um, Brian, Brian, did you wanna start by going through the, well, we'll do the ballot questions last. Should we go over to the zoning bylaw amendments? I know that Andrew and Judith are both here. Andrew, can you hear me? I can, Don. Yes. D did you want to do a brief synopsis on these, or did the board have questions? Let me know if you want me to um, screen share them. Why don't Why don't you do that? Okay, so Dawn, uh, we're going to, I mean, basically, there's a total of, I believe, 27 articles. So the first 10 articles are sponsored by the planning board. Five of them came up last year and five are new. So, and by the way, our first public hearing on these articles is uh, thir this Thursday, 4 o'clock p.m. So if anyone is interested, please um, sign up for that. Um, the first article is really a cleanup article. It's Gray Lady Lane at Bartlett Road. Uh, this is removing a, a prior commercial designation and changing this to residential five, which is the pattern that it's being developed out at. Um, the earlier subdivision contemplated mixed use commercial here and the new active development is residential. So this is a commercial to residential uh, really just following the existing pattern that's there. Article 43, uh, well, look what we're, of course these article numbers are wrong, but the next one is uh, for two properties on Appleton Road where <laughs> we did some rezoning there at the last town meeting. And here um, the owners asked that they be put in they're currently in the commercial district and they would go to the residential five district. And again, that's consistent with um, rezoning that's already taken place here. The next article was called um, by property owners uh, in the area. We've since um, met with them and this article um, is now ready to proceed again. This is changing an existing commercial district to one of the more tailored districts, the SeaTech district, which is commercial trade entrepreneur and craft. And that encourages mixed use um, on-site uh, owners, owners and uh, I guess business, businesses together. And that matches that particular uh, area. The next one uh, at Bartlett Road and Young's Way again, this um, is in areas that have been subject to rezoning. The owners in this case have requested changes back uh, to what we had originally proposed, which was the commercial neighborhood in these locations. Um, it's, I, we've had some discussion about keeping commercial area, commercial areas in commercial zoning, especially where the locations are appropriate. And so these are examples of that. I guess I'm ahead, Erica, you need to move a little bit further. Right, thank you. Uh, article 44, again, which is, don't pay attention to the numbering, but that was at last year's town meeting. This is a single parcel um, that stretch, it's, the majority of this is a single parcel that stretches from Old South Road to Tacoma Way, it's currently in RC2. Uh, the proposal is to uh, zone the area closest to Old South Road for commercial and the area closest to Tacoma Way for residential. Uh, 
Tom's Way is a neighborhood of mostly single family homes uh, in a commercial zoning district. And this would again, align the existing uses um, with the zoning. So that we go from a commercial RC2 to R5 consistent with the master plan. What's shown as article 45 was at last year's town meeting. This was called by a resident and um, believe we've worked that issue out. Um, so that would uh, come forward again. This is a cu currently a commercial district, the RC district that is being phased out. This area is consistent with commercial neighborhood um, of mixed use of uh, residential and business uses. So again, it's consistent with the um, upgraded district. Um, the next article is uh, an article that's uh, generated a lot of discussion. It's an area located in the country district zoned mainly for half acre R20 zoning. Um, we have gotten a lot of feedback and we likely will vote some sort of a subset of this article and continue to uh, look at this area. Uh, I will note this, you know, this concerns about, you know, whether people can have pools, whether people will sacrifice some ground cover. And these are consistent things that we've asked uh, in neighborhoods across the island. So anyway, we'll see where this goes. Uh, article, the technical amendment is uh, typically there's a number of minor changes to the bylaw um, based on experiences that we have with it. Uh, if there's any questions on any of these, I can go over them, but I think they're all pretty minor. And the last one is the swimming pool article. Again, that was called from last year. Um, that was supported by the planning board. Um, we have, I believe we've updated the date on this um, to September 30th to, ref well, and that may have reflected the April. We may need to consider a future date. Um, but again, this was, um, this has been a topic certainly before town meeting and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, um, it's nothing new that we all haven't seen before. So that's the end of the planning board sponsored articles. Any, any questions on those? Judith Wagner has her hand up. Maybe Judith wanted to add something. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Andrew for that good, concise presentation. We know you've got a lot on your agenda tonight. I just simply wanted to stress to you about the pool article that this is geared only to the area near the downtown. It's not the whole island by any means. It's an area that um, there's issues about the spillover effects of noise and activity on adjacent properties. So it includes uh, enhanced uh, setback to try to eliminate that. Uh, it's an unusual article in some people's opinion because it's consensus based to the whole planning board. We've worked on it for uh, two plus years. Uh, we have simplified it. We've looked at it closely. We're going to add further explanation and justification, but um, I just want you to know we've put a lot of work into it and it's not done casually. And I understand, as you probably are aware, the FinCon <coughs> Last year disagreed with our recommendation on it, but uh, we took that into account in our further discussions and feel strongly that we should bring it forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there are any, any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep going through the, the notes that were given to me on what we should discuss on these tonight. Um, there is a um, some general bylaws town sponsored or requests to be town sponsored. There's a noise bylaw that we're actually not going to discuss tonight because Leslie has been working on that extensively and she couldn't be at this meeting, um, but it is some cleanup and um, 
some some changes, but we'll bring that up next week. Um, the Council for Human Services, they we they had done a change to lower it to seven members and they want to go back to um, nine, which was what it was before, now that they've got full membership. So I don't know if there's any questions on that. Um, there was a question about, uh, we had had some discussion about the fines for um, like leash law, dogs leash law violations. And I, I know that this came out of some talks we had had with Greg Corbo about whether we do wanna move forward with um, some fines. I think that our consensus was that we did. Anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, I'm getting thumbs up. Um, John, Giorgio. Um, so I, uh, I actually spoke to Greg this afternoon about this article as luck would have it. And um, we wanted to point out that um, this is a very rare example where a local bylaw can have a fine of more than $300. It can be 500, or it can be lower, but you could put in, insert a fine of 500 for violation of your, your dog bylaw. And as a matter of fact, Provincetown did that just this past town meeting. Thank you, John. I know we've done some discussion about tiering the fees as well. Right. Um, Matt? Well, is that a John? Is that kind of a not to exceed? So we could get the maximum in and then charge, you know, differently, or do you have to charge everyone the same every time? Um, well, it has to be a specific fine, Matt, in order to be able to enforce it through non-criminal disposition. So you could have a, a tiered fine. It could be five hundred for the first offense, you know, a hundred for the second offense. And then you could say, you know, for four or more offense, uh, four or more offenses, it would be 500, something like that. So you could start fairly low, but build it up, but it has to be expressed as a specific amount. Thank you, John. Matt? Can you, can you do it, uh, say, you know, a lease law violation is one thing, a, a dog attack is another? Can you do it that way? Yeah, there are, there are different provisions. Yes, you could have a different fine structure for each requirement. Okay, so why, why doesn't the board think on that a little bit? We'll make, make some suggestions. Yeah, if we can do that, Don, I'm, I'm all up for the highest fine and then work it out. Okay. Um, next up, there, there are some sewer district amendments. I think this is a lot of cleanup. I'm sure D David could speak to it later if the board has questions. Um, then we do have the airports request. They did draft a warrant article and Tom is here and they also provided a white paper. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to review that. Um, Tom, do you wanna talk to us about the proposal? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, First, I want to clarify two items. One, this uh, issue really had nothing to do with adding revenue to the airport. We didn't even look at the financial aspects of it. We were just going through a process, an open bid process, and that's what brought some of this to light. Um, so our objective basically with the what we're proposing is simply to provide an open and competitive um, process for the rental car market. And secondly, um, there were a number of things as we looked into this further that um, just appeared that it, the bylaw was outdated, need some, needed some improvements, not just for the benefit of the airport, but uh, for the entire island. So you'll see, and it, I will say this, the, um, proposed, the proposal that you have in front of you for the Warren article is still a work in progress. Uh, town council had made some comments and our, our council being, uh, contact with them to coordinate some of those changes. So it, it's still being formulated uh, to try to address the concerns of both the airport and the town. The current uh, warrant or the, the current um, bylaw, one obvious issue that we discussed in the past and that is the cap and there are various reasons and you can look at the economic impacts and how that uh, affects the enforcement capabilities and so on. And we can talk about that in a minute. 
But just to bring you up to speed, some of the other items that we found a little bit challenging, uh, the current bylaw has fees that were established a number of years ago, and it's a flat fee. And you may want to consider possibly a tiered approach, just as you were talking about with the, um, the dog uh, issue. The medallions are currently non-expiring and they're transferable with or without consideration, meaning there's a value to the holder and they can transfer them without the select board's permission. So they just give notice and, and I'm gonna ask Amy to correct me if I'm wrong in anything that I'm saying here, because this is obviously much more in her wheelhouse, but um, so there's, they can just, they can obtain a value essentially because they are uh, non-expiring they hold on to the medallions, they can transfer them for consideration, and they don't need your approval. You, they just notify you. So that seemed to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and again, it, it appears that the by limiting the number of medallions, what it's doing is it's creating a, more pressure for customers to choose the alternatives such as the car sharing and what are known as uh, transportation network companies or the Ubers. I refer to both of them as app-based companies or technology-based uh, products. And so just picture yourself when you're, you're doing a trip, you're making a decision as to whether or not you're going to rent a car or you're gonna just use an Uber if you're gonna take a few trips. It, 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 you know, your decision-making takes into a lot of consideration, a number of things, one of which is price. And if we, um, if this medallion continues to increase in value, it's going to increase the rates. What we've seen is our, um, one of our fees to the rental car is a percentage of in, uh, income or gross income. And it has been flat. It was flat. It, it, it was, it went up and then it went down. But <clears throat> even though we've seen a significant reduction in passengers, we're still getting the same percentage of gross. And that to me indicates that it appears that the, the prices are going up for what the rental car companies are charging to the customer. So I think things that we, you might wanna consider um, are again, providing, you know, better or giving the select board control over the number of vehicles, um, the transfer of the medallions and an enforcement mechanism that allows Amy and her group to, to better control um, the, the, the business, if you will. But our main concern is just being able to allow an open and competitive process so that if we put an RFP out to bid and somebody comes in that has a better product that whatever is under the selection criteria is a better fit um, for what our desires are with customer service values, et cetera, that we have the ability to be able to accommodate them. And with or without that, you know, I don't want to get into with or without increasing numbers or whatever, that's the purview of the town. We just want to be able to make the best selection for the customers. Um, one other item I would like to mention though here is timing. And I just want to bring it to everyone's attention. I believe it's already too late to address any changes to be implemented for this coming summer, which by all indications that we're getting from the airlines, uh, they're proposing more flights than they had in 2019. But if it gets postponed to next town meeting, then any changes would not be able to be implemented until the summer of 2023. So if, if we don't address it here, it's gonna be basically a two year process before we see any changes to uh, have any impacts on what is currently hap happening in the ground transportation world. So I'll, I'll try to answer any questions. I, I tried to put together as much as I could in the white paper, but um, again, that's, that's where we are and that's what we, that's our, that's our goal. Thank you, Tom. I, I thought that it was a really valuable explanation. Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add? 
Um, I won't uh, add too much. Um, I think this is a conversation that's been going on in the background for, for a while now, and the airport's RFP process brought it to the forefront. Uh, again, to reiterate what Tom said, this is not at all about increasing fees. I believe the fees for the license and the medallions that are not registered on Nantucket, which are um, $100 each, um, were set by state legislature. So it's not something that we can, I think, easily change. So it's not about that or increasing cars. It's been more about really looking at something that was created a long time ago, making sure it's updated to meet the needs now and to be more actively managed. It's, there's a lot of vague spaces in the bylaw that we wanted to address to make sure it's being fairly applied. There's some categories maybe not being touched out there that people are renting as well. So it's more about that, cleaning it up, making it clear. Um, and actively managing it like we do other licenses for other businesses, liquor and, and other things of that sort as well. Um, definitely not about bringing more cars on the island, but making it maybe a little bit more competitive. Some folks are able to, they are not expiring, but um, if a registration is not provided for a medallion, they can pay $100 for those unused medallions, which two uh, agencies do, and hold on to them and they have till the end of the year to do so. so um, you know, it's looking at maybe more competitive prices and things of that sort, because folks bring cars on that they rent off island as well. So, um, we do not want to increase cars at all, but just have a more actively managed, uh, category here and, um, be a little more specific in how it is managed across the island, if that makes sense, hopefully. Thanks, Amy. Jason, question? Yeah, I got a lot of thoughts. I'll start with this. Uh, this if this article was to pass, does is the medallions automatically added, or does it give the select board and or licensing the ability to increase a certain amount? Because if it, if that was the case, where say we we increase the limit to let's say 700, 750, if we want to on an annual basis, then I feel there's wiggle room, and then we have time to get into the details and like what you said, Tom, of um, having an open competitive process. So is that, how does that work? I, I'll try to answer that. Um, I think our intent in trying to draft this warrant article is to give the select board that ability to make the determination based upon market demand or whatever, you know, things that you see fit. That's, that's out of my, you know, we're not trying to do your business or your job. We, we, we just require our folks, whoever the tenant may be to comply with whatever but I would recommend that you have the flexibility to be able to do that. Yeah, so it, it is quite a bit different than the idea of just lifting the cap on the medallions. It would be a select board decision like it is with the taxi licenses. Um, I believe so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Matt? Yeah, and the, and the taxi licenses are a rabbit hole you don't wanna go down in. We almost lost Bobby to cost it in that when he tried to do it a number of years ago, he's lucky to have gotten back out of it. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think, have we, has any, have you guys in this process uh, spoke to the rental car companies and, you know, and gotten their input like we do with other businesses? Um, no, we were going to do that once we got some sense of what, you know, the parameters were going to be. Um, Cause again, we, we just initially, had one issue and then as we dove into this, it just opened up more. So um, we'll be glad to engage them though. Yeah, we've received a couple letters. I, I, I'm hesitant to, I'm hesitant to start this and try to do it well between now and town meeting. If it was a money thing, you know, for the airport, I might be more willing, but if it's not a money thing, then I, I would like to make sure that we get it right. I think there's a lot of nuances to this that you know, I don't see how we're going to tackle properly in this in the amount of time we have. Um, we have a couple of hands raised. Can I go to the public questions? Um, Judith Wagner. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I find it very disappointing that uh, the planning board and the uh, NPEDC, which are responsible for planning matters and dealing with um, development impacts haven't been consulted in any regard about this. Uh, I don't even know if the airport commission has had a hearing, not 
that I'm aware of that people could raise concerns. We have had at NPEDC numerous discussions about rental cars and the implications for the flow of traffic on Old South Road. So I, I honestly feel um, very disappointed that uh, this seems to be regarded as something where the implications on the ground for the traffic safety and parking and circulation is not even under, uh, is not on the mind of anybody. And I, I just don't think that's um, appropriate at all. Uh, I think that before you should act um, you really would do well to have some working group that has a broader perspective on this than what you have uh, at the moment. And uh, I think if the select board decides it is on its own um, going to try to set the number of medallions and manage the parking there, you'll, you'll be drowning in complicated issues that you could have foreseen and kind of addressed better ahead of time if you'd um, taken the time to do it. I, I really think that's a dangerous corridor. Uh, and I think that I, I honestly find this a fairly confusing discussion because um, I can appreciate why you'd want to update a bylaw. I understand that Hertz is bankrupt and that may have a bearing on what you think about the number of cars out there and how they're uh, being managed and things of that sort. But uh, the townspeople, I, I can promise you, I'll be at the town meeting and I'll be very loud opposing this. And I uh, think there'll be a whole lot of other people with me. There's been no opportunity to review your white paper for the planning board or NPDC. Uh, there's been no opportunity for us to wait and give any considered commentary about it and that just seems to me not to be consistent with the town's uh, desire to have good decision making that takes into account a variety of perspectives. So I, I really hope you will not gallop off in this direction without having um, a more considered discussion that takes into account the planning implications. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Yeah, um, yes, please, Tom. Um, thank you for those comments, and with all due respect to uh, the, this board meets every week. Our commission only meets once a month. They haven't even had a chance to go through a lot of this. They just got the white paper as well and some other things. Um, so there's been a lot of movement since an initial, if you will, first look at, hey, we need something, we need to change something. And now there's a lot of detail. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware our commission has not yet even gone through and, you know, they haven't seen all this or, or, or uh, dealt with it yet, if you will. So uh, it will be on the agenda for next week's meeting that we have. Thank you. And maybe, maybe they could discuss um, present, presenting and getting input from planning. Um, Tobias Glidden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out a couple things. Uh, in several years ago, when the town was going through on the taxi issue, I feel like we missed an opportunity as a community to work with Uber or keep a number of those corporate funds, that 25% here locally. Um, so I would encourage the board and the community to think really seriously about this article. I think there's a lot of really cool things you can do in the context of Tom bringing up this article. You know, Jackson's Island down in um, South Carolina, just outside of Charleston, has a lot of ATVs, you know, street legal golf carts that could be, you know, allowed in maybe a downtown area. They're much smaller. You know, the Boat Basin has a bunch of them. Uh, the Veranda House has a couple. So there's you know, some nuances here. You could encourage more healthy, sustainable transportation on the island. And then, you know, lastly, I wanted to note the how cars are being rented in the future is really changing. So there right now there's about 30 cars for rent on Truro. 
which is an app where you can basically like Airbnb your house, but you can Airbnb your car. Um, not saying whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but there are complexities that should be examined and we should be making sure as a community, we're setting out the right guidelines to make sure you know, we're doing the right thing for the environment and traffic and transportation and making sure our goals are kind of in line. So just wanted to leave you with some comments. Thank, thank you for that input. Um, Bruce Mandel. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, is it appropriate at this time to mention Article 73, which got held over and is now on the potentially on the current warrant? Is this the right time to say um, about that? Well, we were just going to wrap up, I think, this discussion on the airport. Can I come back to that? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. I'll come back to you. Keep your hand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I think that this, the consensus seems to be that this needs some more review, but we're open to discussing. Is that fair? L look forward to hearing what the airport commission has to say more specifically, and then, um, you know, potential input from other stakeholders. Jason, then yeah. Chris. Yeah, I think we need to revamp this and, and do some work on it and, and adapt it. We really do. I'm just not sure if it needs to be what, you know, chicken or the egg. Is it go to town meeting first? Allows us to do that. Can we do it now? And then, so I think that'll help, um, you know, two or three more weeks of, of discussion, figuring out how we do it. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree. I think we need to take the time to really define what the problem was and why we're um, looking at this and trying to like what changes need to be made kind of right now and what are future changes that we wanna look at. I think Tobias brought up some really great ideas about what the future of rentals are gonna look like. And I think we could spend some time thinking about that, but maybe not for this town meeting, but for an upcoming one. Um, I also think that we should try to gather some data. We've heard from some of the car rental agencies, you know, against this, what would it look like if we did um, increase the cap or not, and kind of what would be the benefit of that, and why is that a proposal? I think is something we need to look at. You know, there's a lot of rumors on the street that car rental agencies kind of hoard the medallions, and that's causing an increase in the price. So, you know, I think Amy touched on a better regulated system. Maybe that's the only change that needs to happen, and that could ease a lot of the tensions in the market. Um, so, I think you know what's been suggested is spend some time over the next couple of weeks. I don't think we should flat out say it's not in this town meeting, but what could we do to prepare for this town meeting? And then how do we keep this discussion going for the future? There may, may be a partial change at this meeting. Um, Matt, then Amy. Yeah, there may be, but, uh, but I, and I think why not, why not let planning you know, do its job? Why don't we send it there and have them, you know, come back with a report on it? You know, I think we can do a lot of talking here. We can talk at the airport. Planning can talk, but I think I think we'd have a better result if we have things written down. And like Christy said, if we have things sort of studied and quantified and written down, and the goals and what we're trying to achieve and how this will help. Otherwise, I you know, and I think we should have that before it goes to town meeting. I don't think it's something you bring to town meeting to try to work out. It's too complicated. No, we would definitely need a defined recommendation. But I, th I think we'll, con we'll continue this. Christy? And just a clarification question. We have to adopt the warrant by February 17th. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So okay, so. We have two weeks to figure this out. So does the planning board meet prior to the 17th? And would we be able to get any feedback Prior to that. It would, be, it would be the planning commission, I think. When's your next meeting? That the second. Doesn't meet until the 22nd. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. 
I believe the concern from planning obviously is the volume and numbers and I get that. Um, but I think for us, the critical thing is here, we've extended our rental car agreements for one year. We're going to have to put them out publicly and we're going to have to follow the procurement laws and we're going to have to come through with a, an open competitive selection process with defined criteria. And if that results in the selection of an operator that is not currently operating on island, doesn't have medallions, that may create a legal challenge. I'm not the attorney, but um, I, I think we just have to be aware of that. And if there's a slight change or something that can be done that the attorneys could work out to say, okay, it gets us through that process without you know, encouraging any um, potential legal challenges. That's the only issue I would like to just bring up because I, I don't want to go forward here and think that, yeah, okay, and then end up having a significant challenge facing us. Well, I mean, the input that I'm, re that I'm really hearing is that it may, we may be better served to set aside any increase in terms of the revisions and maybe clean up some of the other regulations that you've suggested and table the, the increase for further study. Yeah, anything that has to do with volume of increase. I, I, I... Because I, I think that, that, that that's the big, the big question mark for everybody. But I will give everybody a little piece of homework if they haven't done it yet. Plug in some dates on Turo and see how many cars pop up that are available because it's very interesting. Um, just to see what's at, what is is happening in a different different realm, if you will, um, Matt. Yeah, no, I, and I've done that too, Don. It, it is it's really interesting. I think anyone who's bidding on this, Tom, should realize they have to get a medallion. I mean, if someone wants to have a liquor license here, they've got to get a list, liquor. They can't just sue us to do it. It's some of them are limited. No, but so, I, mean, I would, I, I, we've gone a fairly long time without a challenge, and I don't. I would hope we wouldn't have one now. I would hope that someone making that investment would realize how things work. I would, I would defer to John Giorgio and ask if we preclude somebody, you know, from being able to enter the market simply because of the restriction. Is that a legal issue? I don't know. Well. Um, I would prefer not to answer that question directly tonight. Um, I, I do think that as long as the you are complying with your bylaw requirements and there's a rational basis for the bylaw, I'm not sure there would be an issue. Um, but um, again, I think we'd have to take a look more closely at that question. Maybe you, you can discuss that before okay. next. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I may. Yep. Uh, John, we'd be glad, to, you know, Airport Council working with uh, Greg and things that, I just yeah. want to make sure we're, we're not getting ourselves in a bind when we put this RFP back up. Yeah. yeah, and I think maybe that would be a good conversation for your council to have with Greg. Will do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Judith, I see that your hand is still up. Did you have a follow-up before where I was gonna move on from this item? Thank you. Yes, a brief follow-up. I want to thank you for suggesting separating the numbers issue from the rest of it. Uh, I just wanted to offer two more comments. If I were a member of the airport commission and this had come to the select board and I hadn't seen any of it, and then I was told I had less than a week to review it and bless it, I would not feel like I had really been consulted. Uh, if you want something for the planning board, we have an extra meeting tomorrow. It, it's not been noticed for this. We're doing town meeting articles. We have a meeting next Monday. We have a meeting the 17th. I'm sure NPDC would uh, set up a special meeting if we can get Zoom capacity to do that, if that would be helpful. But I just wanted to be sure I understood where you were leaving it, uh, Madam Chair. It, it sounds like you think there should be further deliberation, but uh, you're not necessarily asking something from us in the next 10 days, especially since the airport commission has in itself had a chance to talk about this and that uh, you also have indicated that before 
there would be something further done that would affect capacity and PDC and planning board would have a full chance to have a full review. Is that right? Um, I, I suggested that the airport commission um, discuss pa passing it over. I think that that would be appropriate. And I, I think that we are in a position where it may make sense to separate out the issue of whether there will be any increase in medallions from the other um, licensing issues that have come up that are maybe easier to deal with in the short term. We're further studying with, with more input uh, from, from stakeholders, as I suggested, which I was meaning the NP and EDC. Okay, and but there, you, others. there's not a, you're not giving us a to do something that you need from us in the next 10 days. No. I, okay. I don't believe I just, so. I just I mean, want someone to be correct sure me I, if I'm but, if I'm heading in the wrong direction, but I, I no, think that that I sounds think great. I just didn't want to fail to deliver. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, but I, I so I'm I think that we understand where we're at on this for now. I'm going to move on. Um, Bruce Mandel, did you want to raise your your question at this stage? Bruce. <laughs> You're muted still. I'm sorry, am I okay? Yes. Okay, I have just a quick question. I had prepared an article 73 that uh, was put forward to the current town meeting and it addressed the plastic uh, bylaw. And this is a little complicated, but I've been dealing back and forth, uh, bugging the heck out of, out of Libby. Uh, when I initially submitted the citizens article, part of the request from the town uh, folks on the bylaw work group was to try to merge the uh, Department of Health's regulation on biodegradable projects with the bylaw. So I worked that and it ended up being a very tough wording on the proposed citizens article, but I had to submit it because the citizens date for submitting was so much earlier than the town's date for submitting. So I submitted it and in between the time I submitted it and the time for the town's articles last year, the town decided, no, we don't want to merge the biodegradable reg with the bylaw, we'll keep them separate. So therefore, I needed to remove that language from my article. And at the same time, the town moved forward to tweak some of the language in the bylaw, which they did successfully. But they didn't get all of it that we wanted to do. So currently, there's this lengthy Article 73 that needs to be amended to remove all that extraneous language and, and get it down to like one or two pages. And so... Uh, one way I could do this was be wait for the town meeting and try to amend it on the floor, which is a long drawn out thing for the town meeting, which we probably don't want to do. Or the select board could choose to adopt the revised language as their own before February 17th. And that's what I was hoping Libby could get across. Uh, so I wanted to just put that out there as a potential way to tweak some definitions that are needed into the bylaw, take out one line about plastics that are uh, plant-based or acceptable, which they're really not as Graham uh, explained, uh, and just get this language cleaned up and add back some of the items that were banned originally, but the town council and the moderator said, take them out so we can pass this easier, which we did, and they said, once the dust settles, you can add them back. So that's what this is attempting to do. So I just wanted to get out there in case Libby wants to bring this up with the select board or the FinCom in their reviews. And I thank you for this opportunity, but Libby has the language and Erica has it in word form. And if there's any interest in this, I'm happy to discuss this with anyone. Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Bruce. Of course, Libby is not with us tonight, but I know she's had some correspondence back and forth with you. Um, so we'll probably discuss it again next week. Okay, thanks. I'll wait till I'll wait till next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, the last thing I have on my list in regard to this agenda item is the ballot questions, and I think Brian was going to walk us through. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
The first ballot question, um, as you remember during our budget presentation in December, we did suggest that we were going to recommend um, an operating override for OIH. Uh, so that is the first ballot question. It is recommended at $5 million, which is consistent with what was recommended and put on the ballot last year. We also have debt exclusions and capital exclusions for capital projects. Uh, the first debt exclusion is for Newtown Road. Um, the estimated, the cost is estimated at $1.2 million for um, Newtown Road, which was a project that was recommended by the Capcom. We also have uh, the next debt exclusion is the reconstruction of Lovers Lane, which is the Capcom recommended the funding at $3.2 million for that particular debt, exclu debt exclusion. The debt exclusion for construction improvements to Children's Beach stormwater pump station, as you remember, this did pass last year at the ballot, but was not um, included on the annual town meeting um, warrant at the June 25th town meeting. We did not act on this. Um, it was recommended by Capcom at $3.3 million. Subsequently, it's been determined that we will need more than that to complete this project. So the actual request that will go into the annual town meeting warrant for this is $4.3 million. Then we have a debt exclusion for supplemental funding for the construction of the Nobody Air Fieldhouse. This was recommended by Capcom as well in their annual in their report. Um, that is a, for $1 million. Um, and then the capital outlay exclusion is um, actually, could you just scroll down just a little bit? There we go. Thanks, Erica. Um, is recommended by Capcom and has been recommended by town, town administration for the capital program of $751,160. The other one that we did talk about last the, earlier tonight, which is the affordable housing trust, that $7.5 million would be proposed as a debt exclusion as well, and we'll need a ballot question. I'm happy to answer any questions from any of the board members. I can't see everyone. So, oh, now I can. Um, we do have a, Rick Atherton has his hand raised. I don't see any board members with hands up. Rick, would you like to speak on something? Yeah, uh, Dawn, thank you. Um, you know, I, I hate to be repetitive, but I'm gonna be because I think it's uh, important in the openness and transparency. And I hesitate to say, but I will say honesty of your presentation about the our island home override. Our island home is not increasing its expenses by $5 million. I think the town administration is increasing its expenses by substantial amount. And I think you would be better off to be served by being straightforward with the community by re changing the name of that override to the general fund because that's where the money is going. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that input. Um, does, that, does the board have any questions on these ballot questions? I, are there any thoughts on putting all of these back on? It's unfortunate that the pump station is going to be so much more. It shows us them when we put some of these things off, they just increase in fees, Matt. Yeah, no, I, it, we, I, I look at it and think we have to uh, prioritize and maybe not bring everything forward if we want it to pass. I'm very concerned. Uh, so, and I'm not sure, I mean, I, I would prioritize Children's Beach, the pump station for sure. Uh, you know, capital outlays, uh, affordable housing trust fund probably. Although I think we should, you know, I think we'll talk about that. I'd rather see the read article go through and this be removed, but I could change my mind. I'm not, you know, I'm not wed to that. Uh, nobody a field house. I'd like to know what we're getting for a million bucks. That seems like a lot of money for something that I thought was, was already spent, was already uh, budgeted, but I think it's something we need, but I just, these numbers, when I see the numbers for like Children's Beach or Jetties or the Fieldhouse, it's ridiculous. You know, so I don't know, 
it's hard to justify some of these numbers for what are very simple, somewhat simple buildings. Uh, and then Newtown and Lovers, I question whether they'll both pass. You know, I, 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 if, I were, if I were picking, I might try to do Newtown first because we've done the, you know, we've sort of put a building that has increased the traffic there and we put a roundabout that's increased the traffic on those individuals. And I think Lovers is important, but if we're gonna pick one, I would pick that one. You know, so I, it's, and I worry that we put them all on and then, you know, we get a couple at town meeting, but then they don't get the ballot or vice versa. I think, you know, we've got some, I don't know what to say. I just, those are my thoughts in general. I mean, th those are, are good points. We always have to think about how much we're putting on at once. Any other board thoughts for tonight? I mean, we're gonna continue this discussion, so we don't have to discuss it further. I'm not, oh, Christy. Thank you. Um, is it possible to have an agenda item or will it just be part of next week's discussion to go over all the affordable housing options? Um, Erica, under this section, can we put something that's a little bit more specific in language to comparing the housing articles? Yeah. Thank you. Does that, does that work? Okay. Um, I think we can finish up this agenda item for this evening and move on to committee reports as the final agenda item. Does anyone have anything to report? Christine? I don't actually have anything to report, but I just wanted to comment that I really enjoyed having our public um, announcements today in multiple languages. And I think it's something that we should try to focus on for the future. Thank you. I agree. Um, if there's nothing else, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor by roll call. Christy Parentella. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Matt Fee. Aye. Jason Bridges. Aye. Don Holgate. Aye. Thanks everyone for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Don. <laughs>